Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Kaufman from Read Russia. Um, hello, Donald Rayfield. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this Good. is Russian Literature Week's second uh, day. Um, yesterday, we had the pleasure of hearing from Anthony Wood, who I see has joined us also today. Thank you, Anthony, for that splendid um, presentation about translating Pushkin. Um, Russian Literature Week uh, is an initiative that we at Read Russia um, hold every other year, except when we don't. Um, and it is uh, usually in person, uh, usually uh, mainly in New York at bookstores and clubs and libraries and uh, other venues that we've been missing for the past nine months. Um, we've also done uh, events in London for Russian Literature Week and in Cambridge and Oxford. And um, this year we're doing it entirely online. So it's a bit of a uh, experiment. Um, we're delighted that so many people could join us today um, and especially delighted uh, to have Donald Rayfield with us. Um, professor Rayfield is uh, emeritus professor. Um, forgive me if I'm slightly advertising something while I read the bio. If you uh, emeritus professor of Russian and Georgian at Queen Mary University of London, as well as books and articles on Russian literature, notably Anton Chekhov, A Life. He is the author of many articles on Georgian writers and uh, of a history of Georgian literature. In 2012, he published uh, Edge of Empires, A History of Georgia, uh, which has recently come out in an expanded Russian edition. Uh, as have his life of Chekhov and uh, Stalin and his hanged men. He was the chief editor of a comprehensive Georgian English dictionary. He's translated several novels, including uh, Hamid Ismailov's The Devil's Dance from the Uzbek and Nikolai Gogol's Dead Souls, as well as Varlam Shalamov's Kalima stories and sketches of the criminal world, both from New York Review a Books Classics uh, as, as is uh, Lady Macbeth of Metsensk, Selected Stories of Nikolai Leskov. Um, Donald, if you would, please take it away. I'm going to admit more people to our, to our Zoom. Thank you again for joining. Not at all. Uh, you'd like me to talk about my involvement with Leskov? That would be... That would well, be uh, So you're frozen. Well, I, I came across Liskov, oh, it's uh, exactly, almost exactly 60 years ago when I was a student and uh, in an in-tourist bus uh, passing from Poland to Moscow and it stopped in Minsk and it stopped at a bookshop. And um, I'd been told by an elderly Russian emigre that my interest in Russian uh, would not be properly realized until I had read this scoff that reading Dostoevsky and Tolstoy was something everyone did and it got them nowhere. And uh, behold, in the bookshop, there was the 11 volume edition of Liskov that just appeared. The Soviets were just beginning to tolerate him. And uh, I won't only had money and uh, an interest in volume four. And in those days, if you remember, if you wanted a complete set of an author, you had to subscribe and uh, go into a bookshop and uh, collect a volume every now and again. And no doubt the KGB would keep an eye on what you were buying. But there was a very nice assistant and uh, he's let me have just volume four, which has the main things, the um, cathedral folk, it has the, um, uh, the, the, um, the, the enchanted wanderer, the sealed angel. And my Russian was nowhere near good enough to, to read those. So I struggled through and I kept struggling. And I must say, um, 60 years later, I was still struggling. Uh, Liskov is um, in some ways an exceptionally difficult writer. And what is interesting, even the editors of the Russian editions find certain things they, they just can't understand. Those are the footnotes that aren't there. The incomprehensible, his, his language is unbelievable. He has an extraordinary ear. I don't think any Russian writer has so much dialect, so much, uh, is so able to switch into Church Slavonic, into Ukrainian. Um, 
uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's an ethnologist's dream. Um, and at one point I wanted to write about Lyskov. Um, by then, of course, uh, the American scholar Hugh McLean had written a book on him, not a bad book at all. And the other problem is Lyskov has an extraordinary biography. Um, I would say he's probably one of the nastiest people ever to appear in literature. Um, you know, here, a child beater, a man who drove one wife into an asylum and the other uh, common law wife to, to just abandon him and move 800 miles away. Hello? Any fish seems to be there, but, but no picture. Oh, hello. Shall I go on? Yes, the rest of us can oh, hear. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and in any case, in Soviet times, um, you couldn't get very far. I went to Ariol. Uh, the house museum. The thing that was striking in Ariol was a group of old ladies around the museum who all had the misfortune to resemble Liskov. And I asked the museum, why is this? How is this? And it turned out they were the descendants of Liskov's last um, uh, relationship, a uh, relationship which he denied having with his Estonian cook, um, whose daughter he claimed was an orphan that he picked up on the street, but who lived to the age of 90 and, ha and whose um, uh, posterity lives in, in, uh, in Ariol. And I desperately wanted to talk to them and, about it, but it was so many times you just couldn't do that. So an enormous amount of this golf material hasn't been touched. It's in the Pushkin house in, in uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, his correspondence, which I'm sure is prickly, but there are cases, I think, where the less you know about an author's biography, the more you enjoy the author. I can think of cases in English like uh, Naipaul um, or Roald Dahl, who uh, is better just to read and not to know too much, too much about. Well, I um, found that um, I would like, I decided I would like one day to tackle this course most difficult work uh, a Sabariani, uh, which can be translated as a, in many ways, cathedral folk, it's been translated as, really it means cathedral, clergy and congregation, but that's a bit of a mouthful. And um, very recently, of course, it was done pretty well because the old William Edgerton translation came out completed by one of his pupils and it solved most of the problems. But New York Review of Books decided it would like to um, do some Liskov, and so I, ha I had to do two familiar ones, The Sealed Angel, which must have been done a dozen times before, and The Enchanted Wanderer, also done a dozen times before. Um, and uh, I was allowed to introduce two stories that had never been done before, and not all readers will think uh, were worth doing for the first time, but I, I think they are. And the Problem, of course, to do Liskov a second time. Uh, I always remember the uh, dictum of a old Georgian monk that a second translation is a great offense against the first translator and uh, shouldn't be contemplated uh, without serious thought. But in the case of Liskov, I think each translation solves a, a small mystery, develops something. Um, so I, I thought I'd managed to do a couple of things with, say, The Enchanted Wanderer. Uh, the Enchanted Wanderer has a chapter which uh, has been missing until now. Um, it was considered by the Russian editor Katkov to be too scurrilous and risque to include, and naturally the Soviet editors agreed. And it finally was printed in a volume of Literatura Nasledstva, Literary Heritage, um, as unpublished Liskov, and um, I'm proud of having actually put it back in the text where Liskov originally put it. Um, it's a really a very funny story about um, the Tatars abducting Russian women, and one of the Russian women that they abduct becomes the, the chief's favorite wife, and she adopts Islam, and she becomes very, very good at interpreting the faith, 
And the Tatars have a belief uh, based on one of the Islamic hadiths that um, a wife must cut her husband's nails before he, uh, she allows him into her bed, uh, which limits the Tatars' uh, sort of conjugal uh, happiness. And she points out that when you read the hadith, it says, it doesn't say all the nails, it just has nails in the plural. So as long as you just cut two, that's, uh, that's fine. So the entire Tatar tribe is, uh, has its life transformed uh, by this. That was, of course, cut by the Soviet censor. And then there is another extraordinary thing which puzzled me and has puzzled everybody else um, in the Enchanted Wanderer. Uh, when you first come across a gypsy girl who sings so divinely that people go mad and ruin themselves for her, uh, it says her voice fades down to a Malinovi Zvon. Now, not just translators, but many Russians think Malinovi Zvon must be something to do with Malina, raspberries. So this is an extraordinary piece of synesthesia. How can a voice sound like a, a raspberry? The Russian editors go over this. They don't touch this in the footnotes. Uh, the English translators try soft fruit, as soft as fruit, as soft as a berry. And then it suddenly dawned on me uh, that Liskov must have heard the church bells in Malin, in Belgium. Uh, Mechelen is called, as it's now a Flemish term. But the uh, Malin church bells are renowned, or were even Liskov's day too renowned, for their carillon, their this beautiful chiming bells. And that's what Liskov, so I felt that justified the whole work of translation just to get that one point settled. There may be other points that I've missed and others have missed, and it'll be the next translator who gets them. But um, you, you find this in, in, or in, it's an excuse for retranslating. Uh, when I was doing Myotri um, Doshin, uh, Dead Souls, uh, you may remember when Chichikov first goes round the town, he's arrived, um, he looks round a, um, a shop that sells saddlery and horses tack. And all the translators say they were also selling um, uh, bagels in the shop. And I always thought it really odd to sell bagels in a, in a, in a leather shop uh, because it's baranki. But then you look in Dahl's dictionary and you find that baranki, with a different stress, uh, means little wooden balls that you put on a horse's harness to stop the ropes rubbing against the horse's skin. Uh, there's no English word for them, unfortunately, but it does solve the mystery. Um, so uh, Liskov in some ways is very similar to Gogol. He collected words that nobody had seen or heard before and put them in his prose. Uh, the difference is that Liskov always knew what they meant, whereas one suspects that sometimes Gogol didn't. But th that was part of the joy of, of Liskov. And then the other quality in Liskov is um, this is something particularly strange, given his very, very nasty nature. Um, he was a man who had virtually no friends. His children all loathed him. Um, no, almost nobody came to his funeral. He wasn't even embalmed. Um, and it's remarkable that when he died, um, nobody wrote books about him. Uh, his fame gradually developed in the 1900s. Um, which is perhaps why he's still underestimated. The thing is that as a narrator, he is one of the nicest people you could possibly encounter. He doesn't hammer at you like Dostoevsky or Tolstoy. He doesn't demand things of you. He is tolerant to his women uh, characters. Uh, he forgives them virtually everything up to murder. Um, he, he has almost no racial prejudices. Uh, when you compare him to um, Tolstoy Dostoevsky, he's good about Jews. Uh, he's good about Poles. Uh, Liskov is remarkable, being one of the few Russian writers who liked Poles. And although he's often um, lambasted as a reactionary in his two novels, um, one of the most extraordinary things is that the hero of his novel is fighting to help Polish resistance in St. Petersburg. And Liskov had this marvelous capacity to annoy everybody on the political scene, to be a reactionary, annoy all the social democrats, and to be a monarchist. Um, and, and at the same time to be pro-Polish, pro-Gypsy, pro-Tata, um, extraordinary tolerance that he, his literary persona that isn't there in his life, which makes him a pleasure to work with as, purely as an author and a persona. 
uh, if not as anything else. Um, his versatility too is, is another extraordinary thing. Um, he was a man who used an awful lot of documentation. He used to go to the flea market and buy old uh, court records, um, old bureaucratic documents, and then make stories out of them or dig into 17th century um, uh, religious literature and, and completely transform it. Um, so you learn a lot from this scoff. Uh, um, someone once said, I think Nabokov said, you can't read Anna Karenina without learning how to make strawberry jam. Um, and a similar thing to be said about a number of Russian authors. I'm not sure you can learn anything from um, Dostoevsky, practical use, um, spiritual use possibly. And you can read Shalamov and you learn how to handle a wheelbarrow. Um, with the case of Leskov, you learn how to deal with horses, from difficult horses to easy horses. You learn virtually how to paint an icon, how to forge one, how to restore one. Uh, he had extraordinary expertise in, in all sorts of, of things. You, you, you learn the proper order of, of church services. Um, he, 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 without appearing to teach you, he, he feeds you with all sorts of information. Uh, in some ways, he's more valuable than, um, than a historian. I would compare him some ways to the English writer Trollope. If you want to know about the English parliamentary system or the, English, uh, or the Anglican church, uh, reading uh, historical terms on it will be uh, it makes hard work. But if you read Trollope, it all comes magically through. And the same with this score for history of the Russian church is there in um, Sabariani in the cathedral folk, um, just as everything you need to know about gypsies, horse racing, horse breeding is to be found in the Enchanted Wanderer. So that, that, that gave me um, a, a great deal of uh, satisfaction. I learned, I learned a great deal. Whether it's possible to make this scoff as popular uh, uh, as, as uh, other Russian writers are, uh, as the main classics are in translation, uh, I, do, I doubt it. I think that there is something in him that, that um, makes him a, a sort of um, a special taste. Um, is, um, he'll never be, I think, a, a mass, a reader for the masses. Well, what more can I say? I'm now at the age, of course, uh, like many of us, um, when I spend all my time tying up loose ends, um, re either producing new editions of work or, or going through with a translator uh, on, on old work. And I find actually being translated is, is more hard work than translating uh, because a good translator asks a lot of questions about things you have forgotten or hope to conceal your ignorance. Um, so we've, uh, the latest thing has been a French version of the Czech biography and uh, two, two very good translators, one of whom is a specialist in Czech's letters, uh, have uh, posed so many questions that it's virtually a, a new form. So I had to update the English. I also have a Chinese version coming up, but fortunately I can't check that. So that leaves me, leaves me in peace. But the other problem with, uh, with age, as you know, is that publishers uh, will uh, consider any project you, you write about, uh, propose, but what they will not say is what they're thinking. Well, this person might have death or dementia uh, coming along in a couple of years, in which case we give an advance and we don't get anything. Um, so um, you have the problem of um, undertaking anything big uh, all by yourself without any advance and not being able to persuade a publisher to take it unless it's fully written. And um, for some years now, I've been collecting uh, what I consider the most remarkable uh, magazine in 19th century Russia, which is the weekly Vrach, the doctor, which came out, started coming out in 1880. And um, as Ruski Vrach stopped coming out in 1917, and the problem is there's no complete set in Western Europe. There's one in Maryland in, in the States. There's one in Tartu. Um, that's the only European one available. And it's forbidden to export it from Russia. So with the help of Russian friends and with the help of um, Ukrainian secondhand book dealers, I've managed to get a few volumes, but I've still got many to go. And the reason this journal is so extraordinary is that it's totally uncensored. 
doctors in the second half of the 19th century were free of censorship. They could talk about things that nobody else could. And um, it provides a picture of Russia that you can only guess at uh, from reading historians and novels, a, a period of really quite a heroic period. And one gets the impression that really Russian medicine ought to be treated the same way as Russian literature is, or Russian art, or Russian music, as something which underwent an extraordinary uh, renaissance uh, that blossomed from 1860 right until the First World War when it was physically destroyed because half the, half the doctors of Russia were either killed or forced abroad. Um, and you realize that, in fact, uh, Russian medical services in St. Petersburg and Moscow were surprisingly good. Um, doctors had an extraordinarily heroic ethos. Um, you know, one takes Professor Kalamnian, whose patient died under anesthetic. So the surgeon immediately went home and shot himself. Don't think that happens very often in our medical service. Or one uh, the case that is known to Chekhov and to Liskov, they both used it in their stories, of uh, Dr. Ilarion Dubrovo, uh, who tried to save a girl from diphtheria by sucking out the disease membranes and died himself. Um, so there's that heroic ethos and a battle against the authorities, against corporal punishment, against imprisonment. And uh, they had considerable influence and that, that it's been ignored. It's something I'd very much like to write about, um, given a commission. And um, it, it also uh, gives a picture of the fate of Chekhov's cohort, the 240 doctors that graduated with him uh, from Moscow and, and their fates sometimes remarkably similar, dying of TB, um, being reduced to terrible poverty and so on. So that, that is something possibly for the future or something to be left for the next generation to do. Perhaps I should have some questions to answer. Thank you so much. Um, um, Donald, we have, we have a couple of questions that have come up in the chat and I'm sure you can see them, but I'll read them aloud um, just for the benefit of all uh, the others on Zoom, some of whom may not, uh, may be new to uh, chat and, and Zoom in, in general. Um, uh, the first uh, from Thomas Cowdery is, was there ever any dialogue between Leskov and writers uh, like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy? Did they comment upon each other's works at all? There was. It was very one-sided. Uh, Liskov was particularly attracted to Tolstoy and attempted to ha have some sort of uh, dialogue between him, but Tolstoy clearly felt repelled uh, by Liskov as a person. Uh, Liskov, um, uh, I think Tolstoy felt that Liskov was playing with language. He, he looked at Liskov with great disapproval, the way people began to look at James Joyce. Um, he said, he, he's too talented. Um, he's, he knows too much. If you spoke more simply, uh, he would be a better writer. But Liskov uh, was influenced enough to follow Tolstoy in many ways. Uh, he, he became a, a vegetarian. He even commissioned a, a vegetarian cookbook. Um, his religion, however, didn't go that far. Liskov was too fond of priests and church services. Uh, to, to, but he did concentrate a great deal on the New Testament, and some of his late stories are um, stories from the Byzantine um, uh, prologue, which is um, a collection of uh, Christian stories showing Christian virtues and Christian martyrdom. But um, Liskov had an inability to have any discussion with anybody. He was extremely prickly, and uh, he would um, he was the sort of person who would answer every question is what the hell do you mean by that? And get up and turn over the chairs and, and walk out. Or in the case of his dialogue with Chekhov, just pick up the salad oil and pour it over his head. Um, the only people he got on with were p other people who were disliked by everybody. He got on with Tolstoy's disciple, Vladimir Chertkov, who was the man that nobody loved. Um, and that was uh, the one editor he could he could get on with. So that is, I think, a problem for Liskov, his, um, his um, total isolation from, from, um, from fellow writers. He had no pupils, uh, he had no followers, and uh, I suppose his originality comes from the fact he couldn't um, 
uh, uh, he couldn't adore anybody or follow them or respect them that much. Tolstoy, as I said, was the exception, but uh, Tolstoy clearly felt extremely wary of this ex very prickly and, and, and difficult person. Um, right. Um, and then a great, yes, it's a great question here from um, Shankar Satyana. Could you reflect on productions you've seen of uh, Shostakovich's takes on uh, Lady Macbeth of San Skandal? Yes, yes Shostakovich's uh, uh, Lady Macbeth is my favorite 20th century opera. I think it's extraordinarily good. It does add, of course, one thing that uh, Liskov doesn't, which is a, com a comedy. It's something almost Gilbert Sullivan about the policeman in that but um i think it's one of the one of the uh, one of the few operas where you feel that the composer has actually got the essence of the book and that it's even expanded on it uh, I, I think it's an extraordinary extraordinary piece um as for differing the reading i suppose what it does it adds the shostakovich add, adds so much and the history of that opera too is um um tells you something. Um, I don't know whether Stalin read Liskov, but he certainly hated Shostakovich's <laughs> opera. Presumably the thought of a woman who's capable of hitting you on the head with a chandelier or, um, or poisoning you was something very sensitive um, for, 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 uh, for Stalin. The other interesting about Liskov is he is one of the few uh, Russian writers, I think Ostrovsky is the other one, uh, who is, was read in the 19th century by people who considered non-religious literature to be sinful. Um, Chekhov's father um, never ever saw a play by Chekhov, although he was invited to, but he did uh, read Leskov and he did read Astrovsky. In fact, Chekhov's mother, the only play she's known to have seen when she was offered tickets at the Moscow Art Center was Astrovsky, but she wouldn't want her, watch her son's sinful, uh, sinful work. So there is something about Liskov that uh, appeals to uh, almost as if it's religious, religious literature. Um, I must, I must and say, I imagine it's to do with his, his fondness for the clergy and for church service. I must say, we were searching for art, uh, portraits of Liskov to uh, you know, promote this event and Russian Literature Week generally, and all of the ones that we found, um, his unlikability just comes radiating out of, out, out of these portraits, just every single one, no matter whether they're, they're a you know, pencil or uh, oil or what, it, it's uh, definitely a unique. Yes, he hated communing with people. And, and, and what is so extraordinary that a man who hated people so much and mistreated women so badly uh, was so good at them in, in, in literature. I suppose the only key in Liskov is I can't think of a single Liskov story where children play a role. Children are everywhere in Dostoevsky, they're everywhere in Tolstoy. They're quite common even in Chekhov, who wasn't particularly fond of children. But in Liskov, no. A question about your uh, your work. Uh, great question here. Do you do you take a different approach to translating contemporary, uh, in quotes, novelists, uh, than you would to more established ones? Uh, and here the comparison is between Ismailov and Gogol or Leskov. Um, no, not really. Um, I mean, if you're working with the dead, um, or in a far country, you feel much freer, of course. Um, <laughs> On the other hand, there is a responsibility when you're working with a classic and um, there are other people doing the same thing as you and you've got to match them, uh, preferably do something they were, couldn't do or didn't do, uh, justify your, your work. Uh, whereas the living, very often you're the first. In the case of Hamid Ismailov, um, fortunately he was living and fortunately uh, Hamid has a reasonable command of English. Otherwise I would have um, been stuck in a number of um, uh, and passes uh, many times. Um, I never meant to translate from Uzbek. It was an accident. Well, it was a trap. I was given the first one I, uh, I did. I've now done a second one. Uh, very foolish, really. Like a woman who's had a difficult childbirth, swearing she'll never do it again, and then you have a second more pregnancy. Um, 
he gave me a Russian version and I thought, this isn't Hamid, this is flat and, and, and boring. And then it had some samples of, of a very, very good Rus uh, uh, Uzbek poet called Chulpon, a sort of Uzbek Mandelstam in for about the 10 years that he was able to write freely between 27 and 30, extraordinarily good poet, a great poet. And I thought, well, no, we can't translate this in Russian. Double translation is a terrible thing to do to a poet. You get away with it sometimes with prose, but not with poet. And so well, I have a bit of Turkish because I have a Turkish daughter-in-law. And so my grandson, one of my grandchildren speaks Turkish. And um, I thought, well, Uzbek is sort of Turkish. And uh, I used to work with a Turkish printer. And he said, no problem with Uzbek. Um, we, we go to Uzbekistan, we sell um, things. Uh, when I go to Azerbaijan, I'm a Turk, I understand 90%. I go to Turkmenistan, I understand 80%. In Uzbekistan, I understand 70%, so it's fine. Um, so I worked my way through the Chulpon poem, and then I realized that the translation was so bad, actually they, they'd skipped whole pages at a time. One of the translators was an Uzbek with not very good Russian, and the other translator was a Russian with absolutely no Uzbek, who just polished and made up the bits that they didn't understand. Um, so I um, went ahead. Fortunately, uh, Hamid would answer questions. And there are very, very good um, dictionaries, Soviet dictionaries of uh, Turkic languages into Russian are surprisingly good. And they're completely uninhibited. They have all the religious terminology. They even have the sort of things written on fences in, in, in Tashkent um, that shouldn't be in dictionaries. So the, you, you have a good backup. But actually, Uzbek is a, is a surprising language in that it has not been cleaned up by the Soviets. Atatürk got hold of Turkish throughout most of the Arabic and uh, a lot of other things he didn't like about it. And so a, a standard modern Turkish dictionary is quite slim. But the Soviets took Uzbek, they changed the alphabet five times um, until they got it where it is now. But they didn't throw out the uh, Islamic element. Uh, they didn't throw out the Persian element. Uzbek some slip into a sort of Tajik Farsi without noticing and slip back again. So uh, I, I found it a real headache, uh, a, a major headache. So with Ismail, it was a different thing. I was, I suppose it's the Rumsfeld thing, the, uh, the known unknowns. Uh, when you think you know a language well, uh, as I sometimes think I know Russian, then the danger is the unknown unknowns that you just gloss over. If you know that you know nothing, then you check everything. Um, so in the end, I suppose it is a different approach. It means it's much slower. It takes me five times as long to translate to speak. And I've just done another one with Hamid Ismailov actually is, a, is quite a difficult writer because he knows so many languages and he's written a novel about um, a, a recital of the Manas, which is the Kyrgyz national epic. His hero is a Kyrgyz whose mother is Tajik. Uh, and uh, Uzbek plays almost no part in it at all. It's written in Uzbek, but it's written in the sort of Uzbek that a Kyrgyz would use, which is rather like saying you write a novel in English, but it's the sort of English that a Dutchman would write. Um, so that was another headache, but um, it's now in the editing stage, so it's out of my out of my hands. Um, I must say I enjoy much more translating poetry because poetry has uh, certain formal challenges, um, sort of Rubik cube type challenges of getting getting some sort of uh, rhyme rhythm. Uh, I feel you have to have a straight jacket in the translation if you had a straight jacket in the original. If the original has a strict rhythmic um, formal uh, shape, then you've got to have something similar in English. And I enjoy the sheer challenge. Sometimes, at least with a poem, you can say, I cannot do this and put it aside. Uh, if you're given a novel to translate, you can't say, well, chapter seven, I couldn't do so. I've left it out. <laughs> um, Annie Fisher uh, on our Zoom today uh, reminds us that you, you, you did say, uh, that each new translation. Oh, Baranki, yes, yes, yes. How did I translate it? I, I think it's wooden balls for a horse's harness. I couldn't find an English word for it. I have a feeling that English horses or American horses don't wear them. It's one of those Russian um, uh, bits of harness. Um, 
I recently had a, you have the things that are most difficult to translate. That was some, no English word. And I did some uh, sample job from a Georgian novel recently, and they were plaiting rope. And the father does the plaits the rope out of goat twine, and he puts on his daughter's head a, a special piece of wood for her to twirl. And I couldn't believe this. Um, I thought, right, you might twirl it with your hands when you're making rope. You have usually have a forked stick, or you used to have a forked stick, which you twist round and round. So the rope is plaited. And then I found out from an ethnologist that actually there was a wooden hoop that you put on a girl's head. And then she has to just twirl her head round and round while the, the man who's making the rope um, feeds, feeds the twine. Um, no English word for that. <laughs> so uh, these are problems. Anything um, sort of rural and ethnic uh, is a nightmare. I must say, I found one thing of great help when doing these obscure things. There's a reprint of Diderot's Encyclopédie, which has all the agricultural equipment in France of the 18th century, which corresponds to most of the primitive things you find all over Eastern Europe and the Middle East. And so you look at the Encyclopédie, there are diagrams, you see what it was called in French. Then if you get an English dictionary that's old enough, French English dictionary, you could find an English word that was used for it. There's your solution. So Diderot's Encyclopédie is a great translator's help if you're doing anything 18th century or a thousand miles away from your home country. That's extraordinary. I know that it's been put online and in English translation. Um, two universities here in the States worked hard on that. Um, we have Nora Seligman Favorov asking about Leskov in post-Soviet Russia. Uh, has he seen renewed interest, do you know? Uh, she mentioned- Yes, it, I think she's right. The affinity for religion was, was, was one problem, particularly in, in the 20s. It's um, in the 30s that things begin to change because uh, Stalin decided that the Russian Orthodox Church was uh, somehow sort of stepping stone uh, towards um, uh, modern ideology and it was a, a national binding force. Uh, and you find that there are odd volumes of Liskov that came out in the, in, in the 30s, rather like Dostoevsky came back. Um, and I suspect it was also part of Stalin's reading in the seminary. And one of the most extraordinary things about the exceptions to Soviet ideology are the magnificent edition of Biasi, The Devils, that came out in 1933. And you would have thought that was the most anti-Stalinist work you could imagine. Um, but clearly Stalin read it in a very different way. Um, and um, there's something about this scope that I suppose could be said to be very national um, and even anti-Tsarist in its defense of the old believers. So it, it, it wasn't, um, it, it, it wasn't complete, a complete ban on him. And then there were a number of uh, early Soviet writers uh, like uh, uh, Leonov, that uh, nobody reads now, um, who clearly were influenced by, by Leskov and um, uh, his style, his, his method of scus, uh, this business of writing a story in the idiolect of the main hero, which is something that Zoshinka did, is something that Pilnyak, uh, others did. So. Um, he may have not been in 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 in, in the school program. Um, I'm looking at Anthony Wood's uh, question about an iron will. That is an example of a Leskov story, which which did appeal to a Soviet mind, the superiority of, of the Russian technology to uh, to to English technology in the, in the uh, uh, story of Levshaw who shooed a flea. And of course, iron will in the way that um, what will kill a German is just food for a, for, for a Hugo pectoralis as the, the German who destroys himself with his own willfulness, whereas the Russian can survive it. So Liskov comes out as more and more patriotic, particularly in World War II. He virtually sort of predicts the defeat of the Germans by sheer Russian endurance. And that made him much more popular. So it must have been a decision taken just after the war to have this 11 volume edition of Liskov, um, which by no means includes all his work, but it is pretty full. It's interesting now that there is a new edition coming out 
at snail's pace. I'm not, I don't think any of us will live long enough to see it reach volume 20 or whatever it is designed, uh, or volume 30. They're trying to include everything. Um, and what is interesting, some of the stuff that was published at the beginning of the 20th century, this Scots defense of the Jews, uh, which was not reprinted by the Soviets, uh, and his work on, in favor of old believers, uh, that he was in some ways um, a surprising uh, liberal. So it's, um, well, as you know, that there is a big problem with publishing in Russia today, that massive editions are begun, and then they run out of money, publishers go broke, and so you end up on your on your bookshelves with volumes of 1 to 15 of something that was meant to go to uh, 20 volumes or 30 volumes. So you have a dictionary of Russian writers of the 19th century that gets you no far, further than T. Um, and the big Russian academic dictionary is still coming out. I managed to crawl to volume 25. So there we, I think T is the, is the letter which it all gets stuck. Um, so we're not going to get the late list off, I fear, um, but um, somehow, perhaps it'll have to be done somewhere in the West, uh, a complete edition has to be, has to be uh, produced. Um, uh, Anthony asks where... whether, uh, Anthony asks whether uh, an iron will uh, would be hard to translate. I don't think, from what I remember, as hard as most Liskov, but uh, it does require a lot of um, puzzling and sometimes advice. Could you say uh, what uh, Liskov uh, uh, you, you brought into English? Um, uh, I believe it's through New York Review uh, uh, of, of books, uh, their classic series, but which volumes are available in your translation or under your editorship? Of Liskov, only what uh, NYRB has done. I haven't done any other Liskov. Um, NYRB is a little more Liskov than is available. And are there two volumes, three volumes? No, it's just one, just uh, just uh, four stories in my work. Uh, mm -hmm. Lady Macbeth uh, in Robert Chandler's translation, which came out some 17 years ago and, and is really perfect. Um, and then uh, the late William Edgerton's uh, uh, The, uh, the Left-Handed, uh, which uh, is brilliant because he managed to get the puns and malapropisms, um, Melkosquop and um, uh, the Daily te Telegraphed. Um, uh, William Edgerton was an absolute genius. There are these very rare occasions in which Russian puns correspond to English puns. Um, there's the famous one Nabokov uh, brings out about the time in which Nicholas II was crowned and a radical newspaper decided that they would put not a crown on his head, but a cow on his head. So instead of Karuano, they put Karuovo. And the censor got furious and made them produce a new edition. And they uh, decided that they put a crow on his head uh, not a crown, so it's Varuono, and that coincidence of those three three words being all uh, similar, that comes very rare. But William Edgerton did brilliant things for the left-handed, which is why I think um, we, we we decided we had to in, in, in include it. Now, um, the last question: Has Liskov inspired more contemporary writers? I don't know Sharov's and Verlans and Velozatkin's work well enough to be sure, but Sharov, I would say yes. I don't think it's possible now to be a good Russian writer and not to have read Liskov. I think every Russian writer realizes that it's part of the heritage. Um, in fact, probably more important than reading Tolstoy because there's things in Liskov you will find nowhere else and things that you need to do, particularly dealing with strange characters, which is one of the main interests in uh, in modern writing that Liskov knows how to uh, how to how to handle it, how to listen. I do want to add that um, for Russian Literature Week, we've produced a number of interviews with contemporary Russian writers that are on the website and on the program now, including Vodolaskin, mm -hmm. um, and uh, a couple of them actually talk about. Uh, the classics and mm -hmm. contemporary views of these classics. 
And one project that Read Russia has had underway, maybe uh, as ambitious as some of the you know, contemporary Russian projects that you mentioned that run out of money, is this, this four volume set uh, called Literaturnaya Matrica mm -hmm. um, of sort of contemporary Russian uh, writers on the classics, um, on 19th century, 20th century, uh, um, Soviet, and um, bringing out a selection of those into English, I think, would be um, just terrific, uh, especially the, the authors are alive. And as you'll see from the YouTube links yeah. on the program, rather, um, rather vibrant. Yes, I, I'm sure that is. There's another question I just see here from Sarah Diligenti about The Enchanted Wanderer, and clearly Leskov knew about it. And actually, there is something in the Russian tradition with horses in the 19th century that reminds me of my boyhood. I, I spent, as a small child, uh, four years in Australia, in the outback. And used, at one point, went out with another small boy my age, seven, into the outback. And we used to lure wild horses into a paddock by putting those, those water thing. Uh, we lured them with uh, salt bush, which they loved. And when a horse got into the paddock, uh, the other boy, not me, would climb up into a tree and lower the barrier. And then we'd run back to town and fetch his big brother. And he would round the horses up. And if the horses were any good, they would be um, broken and used for riding and work. And if they were not any good, they probably went to Japan as cat food. And the same thing Liskov. The difference in this scoff from Western tradition, at least European tradition, is a lot of the horses that people are so proud of are wild horses or semi-wild horses bought from the Kyrgyz, bought from the Nogai, and bought for very little money, and gathered in affairs, and then the ones that are suitable are selected for breaking, and the, uh, the ones that are not suitable uh, perish in the course of training. So there's constant influx of, of wild uh, horses and um, I, I remember recently a friend in Russia had a horse that was so badly behaved it was expelled from the cavalry and um, that was a Liskov so you wouldn't have had it in Britain it was an Achalteke horse which is a remarkable horse because you cannot steal one uh, they will only work for their original owner um, and they will throw anyone else off but this woman um, um, managed to uh, get hold of the horse and it, it was like living with a wild, furious, abusive lover. If anything went wrong, the horse would um, go around, smash up all its feeding bowls, break the door of the stable, and at one point broke down the door and came into the kitchen and started kicking around. So that tradition of the wild horse that has to be tamed is something I think peculiarly Russian. Perhaps it's there in the American Wild West um with, with apache horses and so on but certainly not in, in western western europe and in the enchanted wonder you have um you actually have a very real figure the uh, Ang uh the american the john rary who was known as the sort of horse whisperer of his time and whose book um i bought for my granddaughter who was horse mad um on taming horses and uh, liskov uh, brings rary into the enchanted wonder but where is too frightened to work with the Enchanted Wanderer. And it's uh, the horrific thing where you tame this horse by, uh, by pouring mud all over its head so it can't see, and then you flog it into a gallop so it has to gallop blind, after which it's like a baby with you. Um, so there is something distinct about Russian horse riding uh, that, that I've seen. There are horses there that no Western, Westerner would probably dare to get on. And there are horses there that should really belong in the wild and the steppes. I think there is a very big difference um, between uh, horse riding as we have it in Britain and France at least, uh, and uh, as it is in Liskov's work. And well, you could write a thesis on the horse in Russian literature, of course, but uh, that's another subject altogether. You'll see some other questions for you in the chat. Yes. Um, uh, on, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Liskov and and, um, uh, and other writers. I found him very, in some ways, very close to, close to Anthony Trollope, 
And Trollope is, is the most calm and, and sane and uh, sort of middle of the way writer. But what he had was an expert knowledge of all sorts of things, uh, a detestation of the city. Liskov hates aristocrats, um, rather like Chekhov, in fact. Um, he likes a sort of middle ranking clergy and so on. Um, he distrusts civil servants. That is something you get in Trot. And he knows how things work. Um, as I said, if you read um, um, the cathedral folk, you have this extraordinary process in which the local atheist school teacher and the cathedral priest end up becoming allies against the civil servants from St. Petersburg. Yeah, this, uh, the, the, there is something in, in that ordinary class of people, school teachers and priests, that resists the people from the city. And Trollope has a particular hatred of, of journalists, although he was one himself. The other one I'd say that you can compare with um, um, uh, Liskov is, is Thomas Hardy. Magical moments in the countryside, the, the creation of a, of a fictitious uh, West Country England, which does in some ways correspond to reality, is really rather the way in which um, Liskov made certain parts of Russia and Western Russia his own, his own country. Uh, with a certain uh, amount of, uh, of adjustment. And then there are always magical moments in a forest in which trees crash down. Uh, there are trans uh, moments of transformation. And you get the same thing in Thomas Hardy, not necessarily in a forest, but in nature or by the sea or overlooking a cliff. So I think that they are good approaches for an English reader who's going to go to Liskov is uh, saturate yourself on Hardy and, and Trollope. And, and then the transition would seem so, uh, so, uh, so extraordinary. Uh, then the other question on, on slang. Um, I would say it's not so much slang as professional language, professional language of, of uh, dealers, of um, um, iconographers, um, of uh, Russian as it's spoken in everywhere in Russia, from the far north to the far south, from from Siberia to the Polish frontier. Um, I find Dial's Dictionary, third edition, absolutely essential. And I have a copy I picked up from emigrants from Manchuria in Australia, <laughs> again, 60 years ago, which is, I've had to have one volume rebound. The, the things in Dahl you'll find nowhere else. It may be that Dahl invented some of them, but even so, it's a dictionary of last resort. Um, so yes, it is, a, it is a form of slang, but these are professional languages, dialect um, terms, which in the end you can always get. Um, it's like the same problem one has, of course, translated Shalama with gulag slang, uh, prison slang. Um, you can get the meaning. The problem is uh, in English that slang changes. Uh, criminal slang, for instance, in English changes every decade. And with each city, with each country, American slang and British slang are quite different. Um, and as soon as the police start to understand the slang, uh, the criminals change it. Whereas Russian fienya, the, the language of, of professional criminals, has been pretty stable for the last 200 years. Um, the police presumably understand it, but uh, the, the criminals seem see, to uh, see no reason to change it. Um, a lot of Liskov slang is, is sometimes ecclesiastic, uh, and ecclesiastic language, as you know, you can see it in Chekhov, is sometimes quite inventive, the way in which they, they take their seminary Latin and Greek and mix it with uh, Slavonic words and, and uh, uh, have a whole plan. So it is, it is, um, um, a challenge in the sense of understanding it, but uh, uh, as uh, Shankar Satchina says, the problem is translating it because English is unstable with slang. So I could give you, say, Cockney slang of the 1930s as used in crime novels then, and nobody um, uh, younger than me would understand it. Um, and um, it, it doesn't last long enough to use. So you end up, this is the problem with translation, you end up with the, the golden mean, neutrality, uh, because um, you, you can't have the whole range. 
otherwise in um, uh, for instance in this coffee you'd have some characters speaking in Scottish some speaking American some speaking English and, and those differentiations don't don't work you can't make his Tatars speak Russian the way that an Indian speaks English uh, you get completely wrong associations so you do lose contrast yeah translation is you know a black and white version of a of a color film uh, that's inevitable a, a couple advertisements in the moments we have left i have to make obligatory one is um for the rest of read russia um read russia's russian literature week uh read russia um began uh, publicly at the american book fair uh book expo america in 2012 we had our sort of initial event there and this year that book fair um has been canceled for uh, ever. There will not be a national American uh, book fair uh, as of now anyway. And that's due in, in large part to the pandemic, but not only. And so it may be that we're going to have to do more and more of these events um, online. Uh, that appears to be, um, with people like you, Professor Rayfield, know not too much of a challenge and uh, in fact a delight. So thank you very much. Those. Um, those who wish to obtain the unique English volume um, from New York Review uh, uh, Classics um, should know about it and find it online as, as well. Um, anything in, in summary um, that you'd like to say? Um, I wish I could persuade um, a publisher to do a substantial three or four volume Liskov um, there's probably not a lot of money to be made of it, but uh, it should be a long, slow burner of a book to stay uh, in print for a few, for a decade or so. I think that would be a, a great contribution. Well, we'll, we'll take it uh, under advisement. As you know, one of our uh, main sponsors is the Institute of Translation mm -hmm. in uh, Moscow, which does so much for a literature in English translation and in other languages as well. Um, so uh, yeah, let's take that up. Um, thank you for being a, 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 a member of the jury of the Read Russia Prize years ago. Thank you for all of your extraordinary work and um, for today, uh, most especially. I'd like to remind everybody uh, who's on this Zoom that it, uh, we continue uh, with live events tomorrow, uh, three of them, in fact. Um, and you'll see all of the other thank yous are accumulating in the chat uh, for you and your talk today. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's times like this when we're isolated, um, solitary confinement, it's a great thing to have this communication. Really wonderful. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll make a point of uh, doing it more often and Someone posted uh, on social media, you know, isn't every week Russian Literature Week? Uh, <laughs> there's, some, there's something to that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again. And thank you all for Goodbye. joining.